Welcome in to another episode of Locked On Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. Thank you all again for making the show your first listen here to start off your day. And a quick reminder that you can find Locked On Blackhawks 100% for free wherever you get your podcasts and also on YouTube. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Joining me today for the third time, I think, in the past year or so is none other than Ben Pope from the Chicago Sun-Times for a quick chat on everything regarding the Chicago Blackhawks. Ben, just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I know I appreciate it, and I'm sure all the listeners out there do as well. So thank you so much, my man. Uh, how's it going? How's the start of the season been treating you thus far? Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's It's been good so far. Uh, definitely good to get back at it. Good to be back in the locker room and uh, talking to players one-on-one again. That, that's certainly a big development this season that, that I've missed the past couple of years. And um, it could be a, a long season, uh, but uh, it's, it's good to have that back. And, and maybe it won't be. A, they, they they looked a little bit better than I expected maybe on that first road trip. So we'll, we'll see how it all pans out. Yeah, absolutely. We'll touch on that here in just a little bit. But yeah, I did want to mention or, or talk about it since you just brought it up. One thing I was thinking about this year with you guys being back in the locker room and everything, how many of the guys even in that room are like familiar with you since it's been so long? It has to be like, or were you even in the room? I, I can't remember if that was, that's how long it's been and how long COVID has impacted everything. Were you in the room when you first started or what was that? I, I was, when I was, I started for the, the 18, 19 or no, after the 18, 19 season for the 19, 20 season. So um, it, it got cut short at the end, but I was in the locker room for that year. But, but the crazy thing is with, with all the changes the Blackhawks have made, um, I, I think there's only maybe three guys, uh, Kane, Taves, and Connor Murphy, who are still on the team, who were there that season. So uh, it's not like uh, most of the guys in there now are people that, that I had relationships with. Uh, we were able to talk to them in person at least last year, but it was more of a press conference setting. Um, so a, a, a little bit different, a lot harder to form a friendship in that kind of format. So uh, there are definitely some guys that, that had never experienced this from the other standpoint before either that had never had reporters in the locker room since they've been in the NHL. Uh, I was talking to Mackenzie Entwistle about that recently, and uh, he, he's a pretty sociable guy. He seems to enjoy um, having having reporters in there and being able to talk about it, but it was it was a new experience for him. He wasn't quite sure how it works. So uh, it kind of goes both ways on them, this being a, a new thing now after the past two years. Well, definitely glad you guys are able to be back in the room and establish those connections with the players. I know it definitely helps on your content front. Uh, I'm glad to hear your year is off to a good start, Ben. Kind of hard to decide where to begin this conversation. It's been a bit since I've had you on the show, but uh, I think a good starting spot would be just the eventful offseason that the Blackhawks had. I know it was a couple of months ago now, and we're full into the swing of the season here, so uh, not going to spend too much time on it, but just kind of a synopsis of what the Blackhawks did. Obviously they trade away Alex to and Kirby doc. Uh, they also let Dylan Strom and Dominic Kubelik walk and, you know, things just became more clear than they were uh, what the team was trying to do and just trying to add future assets, whether that was through the 2022 draft or future assets. Uh, it, it's just clear. This is the direction the Blackhawks are heading and became very evident based on the moves they made this summer. And, you know, Basically, for the Debrinka trade alone, a lot of fans out there were frustrated, uneasy, and not very confident in the direction that the Blackhawks were heading in. And I, I was kind of there, too. But one thing I will say is, after this NHL draft and the class the Blackhawks just had, and after what I personally saw at development camp and at the Tom Curver's prospect showcase, uh, and considering how, you know, there's probably going to be more help on the way via the 2023 NHL draft and how the Blackhawks are probably going to be aggressive trying to get more selections there. Uh, I guess my first question for you is how did you feel all in all about Kyle Davidson's first offseason as Blackhawks general manager and how much more confident, if any, are you in the Blackhawks rebuild after just the first NHL draft under his lead? Yeah, I think like you, uh, originally, um, some of the trades, particularly the Debrinket trade, um, were um, not as uh, exciting or the return wasn't as big as, as I'd hoped it would be. 
Um, but I, I do think of after a little while looking back on that, you can kind of understand the reasons, A, why they made it, and B, why they weren't maybe able to get it as much as we expected just with um, the way the NHL salary cap is now with so few teams having space and with uh, the Brinkett – requiring a $9 million qualifying offer next summer and not being willing to sign a long-term extension, at least so far. So I think those were factors with that trade. Um, I think in general, um, it, it, Davidson certainly deserves credit for sticking to a plan and committing 100% to it and, um, I mean, executing it. Uh, maybe it's not the plan that, that some fans would agree with and maybe some of the moves that have gone into this plan um, are harder than others to interpret, but uh, he certainly does have a vision and he has a long-term vision and, and he is confident in that and he's not wavering from it, which is a breath of fresh air for sure. And um, I do think the draft, as you mentioned, was pretty encouraging. Uh, both Korchinski and, and Nazar look like potential future stars from a little bit we've seen so far. And uh, I think Mike Donahue, the, the new scouting director, has um, really improved the Hawks' scouting performance and that should be a trend that continues forward so um hopefully with this approach and with that improved drafting it'll eventually yield results and uh, we'll, eventually we'll be able to look back on, on this offseason as a successful one even if it was uh, definitely hard to take at the time and you you referenced how you also understood why some fans might not be so confident or not agree with the direction the blackhawks are heading in i really felt like Kyle Davidson had his hands tied and this was something that was kind of inevitable based on how the Blackhawks had gone about things in the past couple of years. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, why did the Blackhawks go this route? Was this absolutely something they had to do? And I personally felt like it was considering they had a really thin prospect pool. They clearly didn't have a good enough roster to compete at the time. I, I felt like Kyle Davidson, his hands were tied and he had to go this route. Did you feel the same way or do you feel the same way? I wouldn't say he had to go the same route, but I think you could make the argument this was the best route to take. Um, I, I think they, they could have tried to reload a little bit quicker and build around guys like Doc and Debrinket, and maybe in a, a year or two they could have been back to being a bubble team or maybe sl slipping into the playoffs, but I don't think they would have ever gotten to a real contender with that route. And um, clearly that, that is something that the Hawks want to want to do long-term. They're not trying to, uh, to be a team that's just hanging around. Uh, they're, they're willing to really punt a few seasons completely to hopefully be back to being a cup contender in the future. And that is something of a luxury that they have because of the, the large fan base and because of the financial resources they have. Not every team can afford to do that. You see a team like Columbus, um, for example, like the, they bring in Johnny Gaudreau uh, to, to try to make the playoffs when, when maybe the best idea would have been to blow it up. But that's just not a market that can sustain a, a tanking team. So uh, I think it does make sense for the Hawks more than maybe other teams to go this total scorched earth route. And, um, and Davidson is certainly doing it pretty much as, as best you can expect or, or hope uh, for the for the route he's chosen. I mean, it's you certainly can't make an argument that they could be doing anything less to tank than they are. So, um, yeah, I think for, for that reason, it, it probably was the wisest move. I agree. Uh, ben, I also wanted to ask you about Luke Richardson as well, another first-year guy that's in charge now, obviously, as the Blackhawks' new head coach. I don't know about you, but to me it feels like Richardson has pushed all the right buttons this far, and he gets the position he's in, and I think he also does a really good job of – making sure the guys in the locker room are bringing the energy and are, are really, you know, enjoying themselves at the same time, regardless of, you know, what the organization's plans might be. He's talked about it many times how, you know, Kyle Davidson, I, I want to make his life hell almost is, is kind of what he said. He just wants to make it tough on him. Um, what have you thought of, of Luke Richardson this far? I know we're only three games in, but I've just been really impressed what I saw in training camp and also how the players have reacted under his leadership as well. What have you thought about Luke Richardson this far? Yeah, I agree. I, I really can't say enough good things about the job Richardson has done so far. Um, just in terms of talking to the players, uh, they've pretty universally mentioned how helpful it's been to, to have his way of coaching in there. He's been straightforward uh, he's been fair. He's had smart ideas. Uh, he's had good communication with players. 
Um, he, he's easy to get along with, but he has the authority and, and the toughness necessary to, to handle the pressure of this job. He, he really does seem to kind of have all the right balance of the different traits that you want in an NHL coach, especially one with the team going through so much turnover like this one. Uh, in terms of his systems, I think that he's made some, some pretty smart decisions to uh, put in structures that, that help the team contend, even when they might have less talent than their opponents most nice. Uh, just in terms of the zone and the defensive zone kind of sticking to the middle, giving teams the outside, um, being willing to concede some possession in order to not get up or as many high danger scoring chances. But then if there is a chance to attack or if there's a, a loose puck or something, then being aggressive at that point and going after it. And then uh, once in possession, move quickly through the neutral zone, not be kind of skating laterally, trying to make fancy plays and just get the puck in, forecheck hard. Um, have supporting forwards, uh, the F2 and F3, coming in to help. I think all these things should should make the Hawks a, a tougher team to play than, than maybe they otherwise would be considering the talent on the roster. And uh, it's, it's credit to Richardson for, for putting in those ideas and for executing them well. It seems like they've um, they've had a pretty specific game plan each practice and in each game so far in terms of focusing on one specific thing, not overloading the team with a bunch of different stuff. Uh, being pretty straightforward um, in terms of what they're emphasizing. Um, I think he, he's, he's really done a good job with all of that. And uh, certainly the results will, will tell. I, I think every coach is pretty popular until he starts losing. But um, uh, so far, he has, he has done a really good job. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, getting into some of that perhaps losing stuff, um, I, I wanted to ask you, before we talk about certain players and whatnot, Uh, I wanted to ask you your thoughts about this team as a whole, because, you know, a lot of the talk is on Connor Bedard and finishing near the bottom of the standings, tank, 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 yada, yada, yada. But um, maybe I'm alone here. I don't know. I I personally don't think the Blackhawks are going to be the worst of the worst in the entire NHL. And I know we're only three games in, and I do think they're inevitably going to be bad, Um, but I don't think they're going to finish dead last in the standings what are what are your thoughts on this obviously it's early but what are you kind of picturing the Blackhawks finishing when when everything is said and done well I must admit in my season predictions a couple weeks ago I did predict them to finish with the worst record (laughs) um so I I I don't think I can change that too much based off of three games where they've lost two of them even if they have been maybe a little bit better in those games than we expected but uh, I feel like hockey is just so unpredictable, uh, especially when it comes to losing. I mean, I feel like winning maybe is a little more predictable, but uh, when, it, when it comes to the teams tanking for Bedard, it's going to be kind of hard to predict until we get a few months further in. But I, I certainly do think that they could finish last or, or certainly be be down there in the bottom three or four, but um, it's also just as good of a chance that uh, that a team like the Coyotes finishes down there too. I mean, that, that roster – looks just as bad on paper as the Hawks does. And um, I mean, the Sharks are off to a, a very bad start. The The Canadians uh, were the worst team in the league last year and didn't improve that much. Uh, the Flyers are off to a good start, but I think they could also end up being a team that, that falls apart. So there's, there's going to be other bad teams for sure, but I feel like it's just, it's really too early to, to make any judgments on, on who's the worst at this point. Yeah, I totally feel the same way. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, and we're definitely waste too early into that race to know anything for sure. Uh, I also wanted to ask you <clears throat> kind of a two-parter here. Excuse me. Um, I-, I feel like there's this weird split between the Blackhawks NHL roster right now where it's like, guys, we know who aren't going to be here. There's some young guys. And then there's also like the newcomers that we saw like Blackwell and Athanasiu and Domi. Um, But out of those young guys, and I would say, you know, Taylor Radish, Philip Kurashev, Regula, Philip Ruse. Is it Philip Ruse? Is it Rose? Can you help me here, Ben? I think think it's Ruse, but I've been struggling a little bit, too, with that pronunciation. It's definitely not Rose, though. uh... (laughs) I've been guessing and probably pronounced it wrong on every episode. I've been saying it a variety of different ways. So, Uh, but those guys... You know, I throw Mackenzie Entwistle in there too. Uh, is there one or two of those guys in particular that you're keeping an eye on and maybe are more hopeful on than some of the others? Yeah, I think Kurashev, you mentioned there, I think he's one guy that, that really could take a, a step this season. Um, the, the Blackhawks are, are not going to be scoring a lot of goals, but they're going to score some. I mean, it's just 
it's impossible not to score some and someone's going to have to do it. And uh, obviously Kane and Taves are, are likely candidates and, and maybe Domi after the CU Tyler Johnson. But I think one guy that, that really could step up into that tier uh, is Philip Kurashev. He has more of that kind of offensive awareness and um, dynamic skill, puck handling ability, vision than, than a lot of the other grinders that make up this forward group. And uh, with the opportunity he's going to get this year, he's already getting some power play time. And I wouldn't be surprised if he gets even more and, and gets bumped up into the first or second line at some point. I think he really could take advantage of it. Uh, I recently published a story on how he trained this past summer with Timo Meyer of the Sharks and back in Switzerland. And I mean, Timo Meyer is a, a star player. He had 76 points last year. I think he was second in the league in scoring chances. And um, it seemed like Kershev really learned a lot from him from that. They're, they're pretty much doing it one-on-one -on -one all summer and became close friends. And, and Meyer sees a lot of potential in him too. Uh, thinks that especially once he gets a little more comfortable in the NHL, he can start going to the net more, getting to those dangerous, gritty areas. And uh, he's a kind of underratedly strong guy, Kurashev is, for not being that big, uh, pretty muscular. So I, I think he could succeed there. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him put up 20 or 25 goals this year. Um, so he's definitely a guy I'm keeping an eye on as, as maybe a kind of a quiet breakout candidate. He's probably never going to be a, a Timo Meyer level star in the NHL, but I think he could be a pretty solid player. He's, he's still one of the youngest guys on the team, even though he's played over 100 games already. So uh, he's definitely one to watch. Yeah, and with through the first three games, we've seen some good stuff out of that second line of Tyler Johnson, Jonathan Taves, and Taylor Radish. While the top line of Kane, Athens, you and Domi, I feel like they've been okay. They've had some chances, but obviously haven't got the finished product. If Luke Richardson does wind up breaking up that trio, would you expect Philip Kershev to be the next one to maybe get a chance with Patrick Kane? I think Kershev could definitely be a uh, kind of guy that, that gets that opportunity. I think um, it sounds like so far they're pretty committed to the Domi, Athens, you experiment. I, I really haven't been a big fan of it so far. I just haven't seen them showing the kind of chemistry and clicking the way that you'd want the first line to. But uh, from everything I've heard and from each of those three guys and also from the coaching staff, they do want to really give it time. Uh, I believe that they will eventually click. So I wouldn't expect anything imminent uh, in terms of first line personnel changes. But Kershaw would definitely be in the conversation to, to get moved up to, into that spot. Um, I think we could also probably see them try – Taves and Kane together at some point, if only for the, the sentimentality of this likely being their final season. If they could play some of it together, that'd be a nice story. But uh, yeah, it, we'll see how the lines shake out. I'm sure they'll change quite a bit over the course of the season. And then out of that newcomers group, Athanasiu, Domi, Blackwell, do you feel like the Blackhawks could be considering any of those guys long-term or do you feel like they're going to be flipped at the deadline? I feel like that's what a lot of Blackhawks fans feel like is going to happen. But uh, I, I was just curious if you think the Blackhawks would be interested maybe, or do you think they're just seeing those guys as potentially a way to get more assets in the future? I think it's, it's by far the most likely outcome for Athens to see you at Domi that they are traded at the deadline. It, it's not impossible that they could stay and, and sign an extension, but uh, it just it makes so much sense in, in every regard to trade them, uh, especially if they can manage to be at least decently productive and be worth a, a third round pick or something at the deadline. I don't see why they wouldn't do that. A guy like Blackwell, they signed him for two years instead of one, um, and he's probably not as going to ever be a very productive player, or a defensive penalty kill guy. Um, kind of a bottom six guy. So I, I could see him maybe sticking around for, for a couple of years uh, just because uh, I'm not sure he's going to have a ton of trade value, uh, but he is kind of the, a glue guy that, that helps just fill out a roster while they go through this rebuild and, and provide some stability. So he's one guy I think you could see stick around, but uh, I think the two, the two first line guys, maybe 80, 90% odds that they get dealt before the end of the season. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, ben, I, I don't even really want to bring it up because I'm sick of talking about it myself. But uh, as I told you before we started recording, I wouldn't be doing my job well if I didn't ask you about Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves and your opinion on their futures. And actually, funny enough, you just posted an article about uh, speaking with Jamie Faulkner about some of this stuff. 
Um, I personally feel like, you know, I'm sure these guys love Chicago, right? And this is all they've known in their professional careers, but I feel like that fire that burns within to want to win, or at least to pursue that opportunity to go and win another Stanley cup. To me, it feels like that's going to Trump staying with the Blackhawks at the end of the day. But obviously there's a lot of things that go into these trades. There's the no movement clauses. There's obviously the 10 and a half million dollars. The Blackhawks are undoubtedly going to have to retain some of that or find a third party to make everything work. Uh, do you, I know, we're early in this, of course, again, but do you think either guy stays? You feel like both of them are going to go. What are kind of your thoughts on the situation? And what did you learn of by talking with Jamie Faulkner recently? Yeah, it's, it's such a complicated situation. There's so many different factors at play and, and different arguments you can make. Well, maybe they'd stay for this reason or want to go for this reason. Uh, I think the, the, really the gist of it is it's it's up to them. We know that. I, I think a lot of people outside Chicago don't realize that, but uh, with their no trade clauses, it really is up to them. And so far, they really haven't tipped their hand. Uh, they've, they've Every public instance insisted they're not really thinking too much uh, about that. Um, obviously, it's the last year of their contracts. They know that. That's a fact. Uh, talking to Kane about that in, in Denver last week, he said that that is on his mind that uh, it potentially could have been his last season opener uh, with the Hawks because that's not entirely in his control. But as far as within this season, any trade possibilities, that is within his control. And, and that's not something he's thinking about at the moment. So we, it's really, and this has been the story of the past several months, and I know it's not exciting, but it's really just kind of waiting and seeing at what point they decide to, to make their intentions clear or go forward to the Blackhawks and, and ask for a trade or, whatever it may be. Um, and Kyle Davidson has said that he's not going to go to them with that request. So it, yeah, again, it really is on them. I'm um, talking to Jamie Faulkner and Danny Wirtz today uh, for kind of a wide ranging interview about a, a bunch of stuff on, on the business side of things for the Blackhawks. But um, obviously they're not individually talking to Kane or Taves either, but they are in communication with Davidson. They said um, just to, so that they can kind of know what's going on and, and be informed on that front so that, if any trades do happen, be it with Kane or Taves or anybody else, they um, can, can be prepared and, and respond on, on the business side of things, whether that's uh, the effect it'll have on ticket sales or on marketing or, or even the nitty gritty like paying salaries and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's not exactly surprising. I'm sure every team and every season, uh, their, their management on the business side is in communication with their management on the hockey side. But it certainly is the case also for the Blackhawks this year. And uh, something that they're they're keeping tabs on just so that if anything does come up on that front, they'll they'll be able to, to kind of operate as, a, as an organization considering what a seismic event that's going to be. Ben, we also recently saw uh, a couple weeks ago, Lucas Reichel getting sent back down to the Rockford Ice Hogs of the AHL. Uh, obviously, I do think there are perks to both sides, you know, whether he's down in Rockford, being the guy there, getting all situations, being part of that group that's, you know, hopefully on their way to another trip to the Calder Cup playoffs. Um, do you think f for his sake, it's the right call? And also one thing I wanted to know is, do you expect him to get called up at any point? Or, you know, do you think they want to leave him down there with that group for the majority of the season and, and be the man there all year long? Or what do you think the plan is for Lucas Reichel? Yeah, I wasn't surprised, I guess, to see him sent down because I had been kind of the messaging all along that they want their prospects to over-ripen in Rockford uh, as long as possible and gain that confidence. And I do see the art for that. Uh, so I wasn't surprised to see that be the end outcome. I, I personally, if I were running the team, I would have I would have kept him in the NHL. I think he's not a finished product. There would have been some deep mistakes along the way. I think he had uh, to succeed for the most part of the NHL already. And I think um, the sooner he starts to really rack up a lot of ice time at the NHL and uh, can make that adjustment, the, the closer he'll get to being a real finished product. Um, so I see it either way. I think I would have gone a uh, different direction than Paul did, but it's not an egregious um, value decision. Um, but uh, I think it, going back to what we were talking about earlier with, with Patrick Kane and potential line mates for him other than Domain Athanasiu, I wouldn't be surprised to see them at some point indeed call Reichel up and, and try him next to Kane. We obviously saw that a little bit last year during Reichel's stints up, and um, I'd be surprised he ends up spending the entire season in Rockford. I think 
when we get to December, January, maybe around that time period, I think maybe at that point he'll be at the level they want um, or he'll be struggling enough at the NHL level to, to be willing to just throw him next to Kane and, and see what happens. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, eventually happen, even if it's uh, a couple months down the line. And I think there also could be some value to get uh, in the NHL before Kane leaves. If, if Kane is ready by the trade deadline on March 3rd, if they can overlap for a couple months, that could help Reichel have a bit of a foundation and confidence builder during his first few months up in the NHL to be playing with a superstar like that and hopefully producing alongside him so that uh, when Kane does leave and when Reichel is a full-time NHLer um, heading into next season, he'll have a little bit of that base and that confidence and that production to, to lean on. So I wouldn't be surprised if that, that happens, but again, it's, it's another wait and see thing. Well, I know a lot of Blackhawks fans out there are excited to hear that. Uh, Ben, last question before I'll let you get out of here. We heard recently from uh, Commissioner Gary Bettman after a Board of Governors meeting in New York City that uh, the escrow is expected to be paid off by the end of the season, and we could see the salary cap jump up as much as $4 million next summer. Can you kind of talk about how that would affect the Blackhawks in particular? And I know you also just had an article come out about how that may help Seth Jones's contract look and feel a little bit better. Can you talk about how that will, or if that is the case, if that does get paid off, how that extra salary cap could impact the Blackhawks moving forward? Yeah, it'll certainly be helpful for the Seth Jones contract. Uh, I mean, it just kicked in. I would believe the eight-year extension is just starting now at $9.5 million per year. Um, and, and, I mean, that's, that's such a big contract, really, at this point that it negates all of his trade value. I think he's kind of stuck with the box, and they're stuck with him at this point, even if it makes a lot of sense. If the cap does start increasing again, it would kind of help mitigate that and, and make it such uh, not such a, a huge issue. Um, I, I think the initial report a couple months ago has, had been that um, they were expecting the cap to maybe rise by about nine or ten million over the next three years, which would mean that by 2025 the Hawks would have as much cap space with Jones as they would have without him now. Um, but if the escrow is paid off by the end of this season and it goes to four million this summer, we could be even higher than that three years down the line that the cap could be in. So that would, I mean, that would obviously help even more. Um, it's obviously going to help every team. Uh, I think there are 16 teams right now technically over the salary cap using LTIR to uh, decide to uh, And the Blackhawks are also in the Seth Jones country in really good shape financially in terms of their cap commitment. Uh, they have the, I believe, the fewest committed salary, the lowest committed salary uh, for next season in the league and, and also the year beyond that. Uh, it's only Jones, Murphy, and Jake McCabe who are still under contract. They have zero forwards and zero goaltenders with more than a year and a half left in their deals. So uh, they're going to have a lot of room to, to take on contracts or to uh, pretty much uh, just make this team whatever they want it to be pretty soon. But uh, obviously the Jones contract is one they're going to be stuck with for a long time. And uh, this this should hopefully help them build around that and have it not be such a hindrance to to the rebuild. Well, Ben, I just want to say again, thank you so much for taking this time to come on the podcast. Lots of fun, as always. Keep up the great work, and I'm looking forward to our next chat. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, thanks for having me. Once again, everyone, Ben Pope from the Chicago Sun-Times. Make sure to follow all his work, if you're not already, for some great insight on the Chicago Blackhawks.